In this lab, uh, you're going to start with a few different materials. You're going to start with benzyl azide, and it comes with a very small syringe. And you're just going to measure out about 0 0.067 milliliters of benzyl azide. So it's a really small amount. And that's the bottle it comes in. You'll also use 4 toluyl acetylene. And you're also going to use a very small amount. So there's another small syringe that comes with that chemical. You'll also need a small beaker with a stir bar. And we're just going to use the stir setting on the hot plate. Finally, you'll need the TPGS 750M amphiphile, and you can read more about amphiphiles in the procedure document. Now here I just wanted to zoom in a little bit on the syringe. Um, so the syringe has uh, microliter readings instead of milliliter readings. So if we need to measure out 0 0.067 milliliters, that's actually going to be 67 microliters. So let's measure out the benzyl azide. Again, we only need 0 0.067 milliliters, and if we convert that to microliters, which is the unit on our syringe, that means we need 67 microliters of benzyl azide. So I'm going to draw up the solution very slowly to prevent any bubbles from forming, which will uh, give us a false volume. And I'm going to try to be as accurate as possible here. Um, I'm going to try to get right on that 67 line. And then once I'm content with my measurement, I'm just going to add it to my beaker with the stir bar. Now we're going to do the same thing with 4 toluyl acetylene. And we're going to need 63.4 microliters, which might be a little difficult to measure out, but I'll try my best. And you'll notice that I'm using um, the same type of syringe, but it's a new clean syringe. So we want to make sure we're not cross-contaminating. And again, I'm going to try to draw the solution up as slowly and carefully as possible. And then once I'm happy with the measurement, um, again, I will add it to the same beaker. In this next step, we're going to measure 2 milliliters of the amphiphile, TPGS750M. I'm going to use a 2 milliliter volumetric pipette, and remember with volumetric pipettes, we can use these pipette pumps where the scroll draws solution up and then the valve releases solution. So I jumped ahead here, um, I filled up my 2 milliliter pipette, and now I'm going to add the solution to my small beaker with the stir bar. And at the very end here, after the solution has drained, I'm just going to tap the end of my pipette to the side of the beaker to make sure I'm getting every last drop. Although a little bit will still remain in the pipette because it's calibrated to do so. All right, and now I'm turning on the stir function on the hot plate. Again, we're not heating the solution, we're just stirring. In this next step, we're going to add a copper catalyst. We're going to add one milliliter of the catalyst, so I'm using a one milliliter pipette. And here is the catalyst. So here I'm just uh, carefully drawing up the catalyst solution into the volumetric pipette, similar to before, and then I'm going to add this to my beaker.
After 20 minutes, we can see some crystals have formed in the beaker. So now what I'm going to do is separate the crystals from any leftover liquid. And while I was waiting for the crystals to form, I set up this vacuum filtration system with a small Buchner funnel since we only produced a small amount. So we're going to use a special piece of filter paper. It is specifically sized for this small Buchner funnel. Now the Buchner funnel is sitting in an Erlenmeyer flask that is connected to another Erlenmeyer flask which will form our vacuum and that's connected to a vacuum line which is controlled using a um, lever on the outside of the hood. So now what we're going to do is test our vacuum line, make sure that we have a good seal across the system. So usually I put a little bit of DI water on the filter paper just to get it um, going, and then I turn on the vacuum line and I can already see some water droplets falling into the Erlenmeyer flask, so that's a good sign. You can usually also hear the vacuum. Okay, so now I'm just going to use a small spatula to remove the crystals or to help remove the crystals from the small beaker. So after some careful scraping, I managed to remove the majority of the crystals into the Buchner funnel. And it's okay if some of the crystals are left behind, we can use that for our TLC plate later on. Let's take a look at the crystals and note their appearance. Now the stir bar is in there, so don't mistake that for a crystal. Um, but the crystals themselves are sort of pale yellow in color. And uh, we didn't produce very many, but that's okay because we started with very small amounts. So while I'm waiting for the crystals to dry, I'm going to weigh a watch glass. And then eventually I'll transfer my crystals onto the watch glass and then weigh the watch glass with the crystals. This way I can get an accurate uh, weight for the crystals themselves. Now that the crystals are dry, I'm going to remove the Buchner funnel from the vacuum filtration apparatus, and then I'm going to uh, scoop the crystals out using my spatula. Now you want to be very careful when you're removing the crystals. You want to make sure that you don't remove parts of the filter paper along with your crystals, so you want to very, very lightly and gently remove the crystals. Now, one other method you could use, you could weigh the filter paper before the uh, vacuum filtration step, and then you could weigh everything together, and then just subtract the weight of the filter paper and the weight of the watch glass to get your final mass. So there's multiple ways to get an accurate mass. And we have our final product. So again, it is pale yellow in color. Finally, we can weigh our crystals. So we are going to weigh the watch glass with the crystals, and then we can subtract the weight of the watch glass to get an accurate mass for our product. You can find this data on the Canvas Lab assignment page. In the next step, we're going to prep our TLC plate for thin layer chromatography. But first, we need to dissolve the small amount of crystals left in our beaker. And in order to do that, we're going to use a TLC solvent. So this is going to create a solution that we can use for thin layer chromatography. And thin layer chromatography allows us to compare our products, or what we think are the products, to our reactants. And we can see if we have any reactants left in our final product. If so, we might need to recrystallize or purify the sample a little bit more. 
All right, so I'm going to mix that around and just make sure that I have some crystals dissolved in the TLC solvent. Now we can set up our TLC plate. So in the large beaker, our TLC plate is protected by a cover of parafilm wax, and we're just going to remove the TLC plate. And we want to be very careful with the TLC plate because it does have silica gel on one side, which can chip very easily. But there are two sides to the plate. The back side is shiny, and then the front side is not shiny, and that's the side with the silica on top. So that's the side that we're going to add our two reactants and our product and compare them. So I'm just going to create a line across the bottom of the TLC plate, and it should be about a centimeter from the bottom of the plate. Um, we'll see why in a bit. But here I'm just going to mark on each side of the plate at the one centimeter point, and then I will draw a straight line across the bottom. That way all of our reactants and our product will start from the same point on the TLC plate. Now when you're drawing these lines you want to use pencil and you want to be very gentle or you can chip the silica. So now I'm going to draw three dots with my pencil. Uh, two will be for each of the reactants and the last one will be for our product. So what we're going to do is put drops of each of our reactant and product solutions on those spots, and then they'll be drawn up the plate. So I'm going to label the last dot as P for our product. The first dot I'll label BA for benzyl azide. And then the middle dot I'm going to label as 4T for 4 toluyl acetylene. So again, we're really comparing the product to our two reactants to make sure we don't have any of the reactants left in our product. Um, this is one way to track a reaction and make sure that you are getting the product you want. Now we can add each of our solutions to the TLC plate. Now in order to do that, we're going to use these small capillary tubes that are open on both ends. So I'm just going to shake one out, kind of like a toothpick, and then I'm going to um, dip this into my solution. Now we'll start with our product, or what we think is the product, and we're gonna dip the capillary into the solution, and then we're going to um, add two to three drops of our product solution to the TLC plate. And we're going to add that on the third little dot that I drew. Now you don't need to add too much. In fact, if you add too many drops of your solution, it can oversaturate the plate. So you want to be careful. Next, I'll add some drops of my benzyl azide solution. And that's going to go on the first dot that I drew on the plate. So I'm going to grab a new capillary tube so that I don't cross contaminate. And then we'll just dip that into the solution and we'll add that to the first dot on the TLC plate. Finally, we'll add 4 toluyl acetylene, and we're going to do the same exact thing. We're going to grab a new capillary, we're going to dip it in the solution, and then we're going to add 2 to 3 drops to the TLC plate.
Now that the TLC plate has been prepared, uh, we're going to place it back into the original beaker. We're also going to add some TLC solvent to the bottom of the beaker, although it should only be about 0.5 centimeters uh, high. So we're just going to me measure that point on the beaker. So that's at about the bottom line. Now, additionally, I've placed a folded up Kim wipe in the beaker so that the solvent will travel up the Kim wipe and any solvent vapors will be evenly distributed throughout the beaker. So I'm going to add my TLC solvent here. And you'll notice I spilled a little. I'm going to let that evaporate and then I'll clean it up later. So the uh, Kim wipe, which is a lint-free tissue, uh, the solvent is now traveling up the Kim wipe. And again, that's going to help develop our TLC plate. Now I'm going to set the TLC plate into the beaker and cover it back up. All right, so you can already see the solvent traveling up the TLC plate. So I zoomed in a little bit so you can see the solvent traveling up the TLC plate. Now, as the solvent travels up the plate, it's also pulling along the reactant molecules and any product molecules that might be present. So the molecules that we have here are going to travel different distances depending on how well they interact with the TLC plate and the solvent. Um, so each molecule should have its own distinct distance that it travels, or if they have similar distances, that's fine too. But we're mostly interested in comparing the product to the reactants and how far they travel up the plate. So we're going to let this run, and then I'll show you what it looks like once it's done. And I'll also fast forward the video so you can watch the solvent rise up to the top of the plate. As we near the end here, I'm going to pull out the TLC plate and mark where the top of the solvent line is. So you probably noticed as the TLC plate was developing, we couldn't see anything. So what we need is a UV lamp, and this will allow us to visualize the TLC plate, and we can look at the reactants and how far they traveled versus the products. So you'll notice that the reactants traveled quite far up the plate. Um, there's even a large blob at the top, so I might have oversaturated it. The product did not travel as far. That one's on the very far right side. So what I'm going to do is circle all of the different dots that I see, and then I'm going to compare them in natural light. So here are my pencil markings showing where all of those different uh, spots were on the plate. So the reactants traveled pretty far up the plate, and I might have oversaturated them. And then the product is shown on the right, and that did not travel as far. So comparing these two, we can see a pretty big difference between the reactants and the products, which is a good sign. So now what we're going to do is I'll post a picture of the TLC plate next to a ruler and you're going to measure the distance that each dot traveled. You're also going to calculate what are called RF values or a retention factor. Um, and you can find how to do that in the Zubrick lab manual. And that's the end of the lab. So you can find all of the data, pictures, and post lab questions on the lab assignment page on Canvas. Good luck and let me know if you have any questions.